All right, hello and welcome. This is Aurora with Central Coast Astronomical Society and I want to welcome you to tonight's stargazing session. How are you? How have you been enjoying the night sky? If you haven't been enjoying it at all, you will after this class, I guarantee it. We're going to be on tonight for about 30, maybe 40-ish, 45 minutes. We'll see how it goes. Um, for tonight, we are going to be looking at some uh, five different objects in the night sky. Also talking to you about a, a space mission that actually started today, about 12 hours ago. And I will also be answering questions, not just me, but the happy astronomers that are on our session with us tonight. So yay. All right. So before we get started, if you could drop me a note in the chat, just let me know where you are connecting from in the world that will help us astronomically speaking. So we can also include a little few tidbits as we go along. Uh, for tonight's stargazing session. So um, I'm going to be introducing Brian, who's in just a second. He is going to be our my co-host for tonight, <laughs> my partner in astronomy crime, I guess. And uh, we're going to be giving you a tour of the night sky. If you have a telescope, that's great. You don't need one. We actually are going to be showing you some objects that you can use just with naked eye and um, binoculars, okay, with binoculars. And so we're going to be pointing those out. Uh, before I bring Brian on, if you haven't already, uh, know about this. These are free stargazing charts that are available from skymaps.com. And so you can download, the, um, download them. I'm going to point out where they are on the star chart after we talk about them. So it's just a, a neat way to take notes and so forth. But they, they get published every month and they are free. All right, Brian, let's bring you on. There you are. Yes, hello. Hi. Glad I could join you tonight. Yes. So normally you are outside freezing because you're by a telescope. <laughs> yes, not freezing quite yet because I'm in Southern California <laughs> so far. Yeah, freezing comes soon. But yeah, unfortunately, the clouds did not cooperate. First, I had wind earlier in the week that prevented me from setting up my equipment. And then there were clouds that came in too late for me to set up equipment. But I do still have a great simulator called Telescopius that I'll use. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about each object, we'll give you an idea of what it would look like in uh, binoculars and then also in a telescope so that when you everyone goes out to try it, you all who are watching or listening to this, then you'll have an idea of where you're going and what you're after. Exactly. Okay, great. I'm looking forward to this. So um, we've um, Brian has put together a list of objects. We're going to go through them step by step, and then I'm going to show you. We're going to talk about what it is, you know, and <laughs> so basically we're going to show you where it is in the night sky, and then we'll talk about the object itself. So you not only know what it is, but you know where to find it and how to explain it to other people as well. Okay, so um, before, real quick before we start, a couple of quick announcements specifically for the Central Coast Astronomical Society. We have a stargazing event tomorrow, and it is happening in the evening, and it is at sunset. We're going to be at the Santa Margarita Lake. It is not the last one of the year. It's the last one that we publish dates for, and so we will be releasing new dates for the next 12 months very, very soon. Um, but if you'd like to join us, we actually are going to be live next um, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. And also, Brian, what's happening tomorrow? I think that there's an annular eclipse tomorrow. <laughs> actually, Yes. So, and, and so that'll be a solar eclipse. We're, we'll see it starting up uh, by Oregon and then coming down across the, let's say, western United States. Now, what's interesting is this is annular. That means that even in the areas that you'll see the most of the sun covered, there will still be a ring. They call it a ring of fire. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of information online. Um, so if you just Google uh, 2023 eclipse, and then you can look and see the start and stop times for your area and how much of the sun will be covered. And this would be for the continental United States too. And we, we cannot mention the sun without also saying, never ever look at the sun uh, with your own eyeballs. Right. Even if you try to put 20 pairs of sunglasses in front, that's not good enough. You need to use proper eclipse glasses that are certified safe eclipse glasses or a proper solar filter. Exactly. And so, but if you're not aware of what that is, don't, don't try. Right. Oh, exactly. I would mention one thing that you can do is you can take a piece of cardboard, put a little pinhole through that mm -hmm. and allow the sun to shine through that onto the ground or the wall. Mm -hmm. And you can look at that reflection. Don't try to look through the pinhole. That's not what you're doing, but you can look at the reflection 
And uh, you'll see not lots of neat pictures, for instance, sometimes where sunlight will come through holes in leaves, just how the leaves are scattered, then you see a bunch of little eclipses cast down on the ground. So pinhole is what you want to do if you don't have any other option. Yes. And so here's a picture of it here um, for a pinhole solar projector. And you would just, um, you could just look online for something less like this. So yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, so shall we get started with our stargazing uh, for tonight? Yes, indeed, I think so. Okay, great. I'm going to hand it and over to so, you to get us great. started. Ready, set, go. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so our, our first object we have up here, this is called the double cluster, and it's in the constellation Perseus. Now, to give you a frame of reference for what's going on, this is my program called uh, Telescopius, and this is available free online at that exact address, telescopius.com. And I have this set here. This green ring with this setting gives you what an apparent view of the sky. And this is what we would say is nine degrees, which is an angular size across. To give you a, an idea, uh, the full moon would be half a degree. But if you notice here, we have these two little fuzzies right here in the middle. That is the double cluster. This is a wonderful binocular object and even a naked eye object. Naked eye means that on a if you're in a relatively dark location, you could go outside and then we're going to show you where you can find it. And then you can actually go and see the double cluster with your own eyes. And then if you're lucky, you might see the Andromeda galaxy not too far off from there. But a couple of facts, by the way, I'll tell you. One, the names for these two clusters, they have NGC numbers, which stands for New General Catalog. They're NGC 869 and 884. Now, by the way, if you're wondering about what it would look like in a telescope, I'll flip over here to an eyepiece, and we can see here that, that now this green ring is representing uh, a much smaller area of the sky. We've zoomed in, so to speak. This is the approximate view that you would have in an 8-inch telescope within this green circle. So you can see they're much expanded <laughs> and it, with an eight inch scope you're actually not going to be able to even see both clusters together uh, but these two by the way as mentioning their naked eye when we talk about brightness of objects in the night sky we use a a system called magnitude these are called a uh, magnitude of 3.7 and 3.8 now the magnitude could be confusing the closer that number is getting towards zero the brighter the object actually is and then, for instance, sometimes we have objects like Venus can go into negative one or so for brightness. But these are bright at 3.7 and 3.8. And so if you have a good dark location, you should be able to see them. Awesome. Yeah, that is an amazing program. I'm just, I am excited to play with it for tonight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's really useful also for planning astrophotography. You can get an idea of what you can put in the particulars for your camera setup. And then it, that's that was its primary job is then you can plan for what you might be able to capture with your equipment. Oh, oh, I could see that. Really good for planning. Great. Well, let's take a look at yes. where it is in the night sky. So if we were to go outside and look up, it would look like this, right? We have a lot of stars. They all kind of look the same. So how do you know where to find this thing? Okay. So what we want to do is we're going to be looking northeast tonight. And so you're going to go out. So look north, look east, and go between the two. And then you're going to see this W, and I realize I don't have a cursor. Let me grab it. Um... There we go. Nice. I have a cursor now. Great. Okay, so we're going to see Cassiopeia, which is this large W. You see how we can connect the dots here? Isn't that convenient? I wish we could do this in the night sky. All right, so <laughs> we can see that we have the, the five stars here that make the constellation Cassiopeia. Most people can find that one. What, uh, what we want to do is we want to drop down closer to the horizon and find this really bright star. So this is going to be in Perseus. So we're going to go between Cassiopeia, the constellation, and that bright star here in Perseus. If we take off the dots, you still see Cassiopeia here? Okay, so we're going to go between Cassiopeia and that bright spot in Perseus, and we have an area right in here we're going to zoom in on. And do you see how it looks like what Brian had in his um, telescope view? Yep, and so we have the double cluster. 
I forget which one is which, but uh, I put both of them in, in there, 869 and 884. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the double cluster, and it's beautiful. It is beautiful to look at. Um, and so, Brian, would you say binoculars, you could use this on this one as well? Absolutely. In fact, I would consider this a naked eye slash binocular object. Um, okay. Any telescope larger than, let's say, a four inch is going to blow this apart to where you won't be able to see the <laughs> both of the clusters together. Right. Okay, great. And then on your um, on your chart here, if we take a look, the evening sky map, if we go to, and we're going to be looking here, this is up near the top, we see the great square of Pegasus. Here, let me move it over a little bit. See the great square of Pegasus here. And, all right, so here's, here's um, so you're going to hold this over your head, so right at zenith, so right above your head. If you were to look straight up, <laughs> it's going to be up here. Here's north, which is on this side, and here is east. So we're going between north and east, and so northeast is here. And we're going to come up, up, so this is the horizon, okay? We're going to go up, up, up and start to lift our head. And we see that bright star in Perseus here. And we see Cassiopeia here. So right between the two, and it's actually labeled, and it says double cluster right there. And that's the one we were looking at tonight. So this is the first object for tonight. It was 869 and 88, what was the second one? 884, is that right? Let me bring it back up here. Yeah, 869 and 884. Yes, you had it right, exactly right. Exactly. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. So you're not looking straight overhead, uh, and you're not looking straight at the horizon. It's about halfway up, okay, and you're at northeast. Okay, good. All right, so what else do we have tonight, Brian? Next, um, we're going to go to an object called the blue snowball. And you know, Aurora, something I think is funny as I was putting the objects together, I realized that we're staying in a similar region of the sky, mm -hmm. but each object is in a different constellation within the boundaries of a different constellation. <laughs> so now we're, we're technically in, in the, the boundaries of the constellation Andromeda, and we have what's called the blue snowball, and it is right here centered. So we can see here then, this is the view for an approximate view for an eight inch telescope. And we can see that little blue fuzzy. And this is often what we get. By the way, while this can give us a good approximation of the size we would have of the object in the eyepiece, it's not going to be a good simulation of brightness because these are still photographs. And we have to do extra hurdles if we wanted to simulate how much uh, light pollution you have in your area, how sensitive your eyes, et cetera. So you get an idea of size here. But this is the blue snowball. And so this is a planetary nebula, and I try to always grab at least one planetary nebula. They're always fun to look at. This is smaller in the eyepiece than some of the others that we've seen in the past, for instance, like the ring nebula or the dumbbell. But uh, to give you an idea then of what we would look like in binoculars, we'd see this would not be considered a binocular object. That little tiny fuzzy, little blue fuzzy here, and by the way, with our own eyes, it's very rare to see color. So you're just looking for a little fuzzy. That is the snowball, or the blue snowball technically. So an eyepiece with a telescope is definitely a better option. So you know, I would say eight inch or larger if you want to go after this one. A, a couple of things to keep in mind, this is called NGC 7662, and it has an apparent magnitude of 8.6. So much more dim in the night sky. Remember that bigger that number goes, the more dim the object. It's pretty far away. Interestingly, they have difficulty pinning this down exactly how far away this object is. It's believed to be between 2,000 to 6,000 light years away. That's a pretty big border or boundary or range. So that means that it's probably a minimum of the light that we're seeing now left that object about 2,000 years ago, just about. Wow. Okay, yeah, so that's what All I right. want to share about this one. So how do we find it? This is my job. And by the way, just a quick shout out yes. to Kent over the years for helping teach us how to do this. <laughs> Absolutely. So those of you who have been uh, with, us, with us before or been to a star party, you know Kent is one of the world's leading experts on planetary nebula just by pure observation. They use him to correct computer programs. Okay, so <laughs> let's see here. We are looking in the night sky, and if you look here, do you see Cassiopeia down here? Do you see how it's one, two, three, four, five? 
you see it right down there? I hope I have a cursor. I do, I do. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we have Cassiopeia, but now we're going to be looking at a couple other constellations. Do you see the great square of Pegasus here? Here, if we put the pictures in, you can kind of see how Pegasus is there. Okay, so we're going to go between this star of Pegasus, okay? So kind of the front legs here, yeah, where they uh, meet. Uh, it happens to be Beta uh, Pegasi. Beta Pegasi. That one. Perfect. I didn't know how to say the Or Sheet name. is the other name. Sheet? Is that how you say it? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, S-C-H. It's like S-Cheat is what yes. it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like S-Cheat. Yes. So we have one star here and then also this end star here in Cassiopeia. So if you can kind of draw a line between the two. Here, I'll make it a little bigger. Between the two... And we are going to find the object right midway between. Do you see these three little stars and this bright star up here? So if you can find this in the night sky, this little J, it's going to be right on the stem of the J. So let's zoom in. And sure enough, look what we have here. We have a star. That's the wrong thing. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Let me do that again. Let's see. Let me put the markers on it so you can see it. There. Oh, I was so close. I was just off by a little bit. There it is. Okay. And there is our blue snowball. And it froze, and you are not seeing it. Hang on. So sometimes Stellarium um, fights with, with the program that I'm using. Give me just a second. OK, do you see it now? Yeah, OK. So here, what we want to do, let me do that again, because I'm not sure when it froze. Um, OK, so we have the great square of Pegasus, and then we also have Cassiopeia. So we're going to take this end star here in Cassiopeia and the intersection of the legs in um, N S cheat <laughs> sheet in um, <laughs> the great square of Pegasus. And we're just going to draw a line between the two and you're going to start exploring in this area. So we have three stars here and one star up there. And we're going to look right in this area here. And let me put the markers on it so you can see it. You can see how it's right there. And if we zoom in, you'll see a snowball. All right, and then yeah, and so oh, if go ahead. Well, I was going to, to mention uh, what what uh, what I would do if I was going after this. Let's say with my Dobsonian uh, telescope, where I couldn't just punch in go to blue snowball. <laughs> um, I would probably start with my finder scope, which would be a much lower magnification. Mm -hmm. I'd use the my Telrad, which pr uh, gives an appearance of little red circles on the sky. That's zero power to get close. And then by using the, the finder, we'd, I'd use a really wide eyepiece that has as wide a sky as possible to start look for a really faint blue and then try to add more power to it. This is the kind of object where it's out away from bright stars where it'll take some practice to star hop to find it. But it's I think that makes it all the more satisfying when you do lock in on it and are able to bring it into your eyepiece. Oh, it is. You feel like throwing a party and, and telling everybody you found mm -hmm. it. Um, <laughs> All right, let's look really quick on your star map. So here is the great square of Pegasus, which is right in this area here. And then we are looking between here. So if you draw a line between this star of Cassiopeia and this in Pegasus, here's your line. And you'll be looking right in this area here. So X marks the spot. And so this is where you'll find the blue snowball, right in there. And read that number to me again. It was NGC 76. Oh, sure. Six, um, seven, uh, six, six, seven, six, six, two. two. There we go. Seven, six, six, two. Great. Okay, great. All right. So. Awesome. We had a question come in uh, that I thought I might address. It actually came in from my daughter, Julianne. <laughs> I just saw on the YouTube chat. And uh, she asked, why do they have so much trouble figuring out the distance to the blue snowball uh, nebula? Mm -hmm. And then she pointed out, Kent probably knows it intrinsically down to the the yes, fraction of a light year. And I yes, agree, Kent probably does. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is that, would that work right now, Aurora, yeah, to yeah. address that question? Please, please. Okay, great. So we have a few different ways of telling the distance to objects out in space. And depending on how far the object is from Earth, they start using different techniques. The most common one you find is called parallax. And you can understand a little bit more about parallax if you hold your thumb out at your dist your 
basically stretch out your arm and then hold your thumb, put it over an object far away, and then open one eye and close the other and go back and forth. And you'll notice that the object seems to move in relation to your thumb. And that is the difference in perspective from one eye to the other. Well, with our Earth, we happen to circle around the sun. And so astronomers can look at the angle from the Earth to the sun. Or excuse me. When we're at one side of our orbit, we can look at our angle to that object, like the blue snowball. And then when we orbit around the sun to the other side, they can look at that angle. By measuring that angle, they have a triangle, and they can have an idea of the distance. The problem is with certain objects in certain distances, that's not enough of an angle to lock it down to a precise reading. We have other methods we won't get into. One of them is, is measuring the shift of light coming from that object, if it's moving away or coming towards us, things of that nature. But the idea is with the techniques we have, we're just not able to lock into it. Oh, wow, that's, that's, that was quick, Aurora. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that's an example of using parallax. Exactly. And we actually talk about this in, um, I have an online science program, and we spend six to seven weeks. And this is actually one of the activities the kids get to do is I give them measurements, and they have to tell me how far stars oh, are. Oh, fun. So that's part of their math lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky <Wonderful>. students. <laughs> um, and so, I yeah, I was thinking of something. Uh, we had another question come in by email just now. Um, but you know what? Let me hold it till, till we get a bit further. with what. We, do you want to do one more object? Okay, yeah, let's do one more. Well, let's go on to our next object. Yeah. This one uh, has uh, some fun names. Now, it's often called the dragonfly cluster, but it has a name that's more fun, and I'll share that with you in a moment. Now, the cluster is right here in the middle, and it's actually these, and this would, by the way, would be considered an open cluster, which means these are stars that are loosely related to each other that are farther away. And... Uh, there's an artifact from how they meshed the pictures together. The If we looked up in the night sky or took a picture, there wouldn't really be this square like that. That's how they knit pictures together. But uh, what's happening here is we have these two bright stars, and then there's a larger collection of more dim stars off to our apparent right. That is the dragonfly cluster, and this is the binocular view. But if we hop over to the eyepiece view, you can uh, one, possibly see why it also has another nickname. This is also called the ET cluster. Now, if uh, ET would be somewhat upside down right now, but some people associate the two eyes as ET's eyes, and then this would be coming off as his, his body. Oh. So sometimes people call that the ET cluster. I think and of this one this as the one's, owl cluster. Oh, is that the other uh, name for sorry, it? The owl, the owl cluster, is that right? Uh, that one, that one too, I didn't have that in my notes. I could definitely check and see what Stellarium has to say. Stellarium is really good about having about every nickname that comes up for these <laughs> objects. So... Let's see, I can try it. I have it here, here, actually. Um, I've got it pulled up. It's got owl cluster. Oh, okay. Right so, but yeah, whatever it is, okay. whatever object great. you can see yes. is great. And that makes, owl cluster makes sense to me, too, with those big old eyes yeah. right there, for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, one fact I wanted to share with this one, this one is much farther away than our last object at approximately 7,900 light years from the sun. So much farther away. Wow. Should we check out how to find it? Yes, I think that's a good idea. And while you're working on loading, oh, you probably already have it up, but the question did come up, um, wasn't the owl a nebula? And yes, there's an owl nebula and there's an owl cluster. They're two completely different objects. Yes, yes, that is right. Um, okay, so I have it up just because it's really close to Cassio. It's in Cassiopeia, which we haven't strayed far from. Um, okay, so again, we're looking for the the five stars for Cassiopeia here, and we're going to be looking. You see how there's? Oh, here, let me pull this off. Do you see how there's two triangles, like a large triangle of the brighter stars, and then more of a um, the this triangle has less of a height. That's the one you want to focus on, the one with less of a height. Okay, so the kind of the squash triangle. And then, let me put the brackets on it. 
you're going to look right in this area here. Okay? And so it's, this is a really fun, fun one to look at because as soon as you show it to people, you ask them, well, what kind of, and you kind of describe the owl or whatever shape that you're going for. And they're like, oh, I see it, I see it, just because the stars are so bright. All right. Um, let's. Yes, take a look. I agree. That's this is definitely a good object to go after. It is with uh, binoculars or telescope. It is, and it's be it's right next to Cassiopeia, which is really easy to find. So on our um, yes. on our chart here, Cassiopeia. Here, you know what? I better bring the camera down a little bit. All right. So um, Cassiopeia is. I'm wondering if I should rotate this. No, that's okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to find, Cassiopeia is the one we've been drawing all over. <laughs> and so this is the narrower of the two. And so we are going to be looking right there. Okay. And so unfortunately, I already drew a red line there. But okay, so there's our Owl Nebula. And the NGC number for that one is... Dun, 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 dun. I should really keep those up on you my really screen. Need to keep I already go on to the next slide. <laughs> NGC 457. <laughs> NGC 457 is right there. Exactly. It's right underneath one of And if you look in the wrong triangle, that's not a big deal because it won't be there. And then you just look at the other triangle. Exactly. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. So if you want to go back really quick just to review here, we're going outside. We're looking at the night sky. It's beautiful. Let me put the horizon in. Okay. So it's beautiful. The first one we saw was uh, between north and east. Okay. So it was northeast. And we were looking, we're starting to raise our head above the horizon. We see Cassiopeia here. We also see Perseus, the bright star there. And then we're looking partway in between the two. And we should be able to see a double cluster, which is right there. Look at that, right in between the two. That was the first, well, the first two objects, NGC 869 and 884. And then the blue snowball, if you remember, keep Cassiopeia in mind, but just look up a little bit more. And also, we're going to take this star here, so I'll put a pointer there, and then this star here, this is in the Great Square of Pegasus, which to me it looks huge in the sky. And we're going to connect these two with a line, go about halfway in, and you see the three stars here on the bottom of the J, and here's the top. We're going to look right in this area, and we should be able to see the blue snowball. Let me put the brackets on it again. Blue snowball. There it is. And that's our blue snowball. Again, a telescope object, good to find. It's not easy to star hop to. Um, it looks easy because I'm using planetarium software, but when you're out there with a telescope, it's not so easy. <laughs> and then the third one is you go back to Cassiopeia. Okay, let's see if we can find Cassiopeia. Do you see it? See, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, take the shallower of the two triangles and just start to explore around there, and you should see two cute little eyeballs peeking out at you. All right, how was that for a quick review? Yes, I think that was a very good review. Okay, it's great. definitely nice to recap these objects. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. It's all yours, Brian. Okay, awesome. So uh, we have two more objects to share in the night sky. But before we do that, I want to take a moment to share about a NASA mission that actually just launched today. And this would be, that would be the Psyche mission. Now, this is a view from a program called Eyes on the Solar System, which is free on a website from NASA. And we can see here, if I zoom out a little bit, here's Earth, and then you can see some other curly cues for different missions, but we're focusing on Psyche. Now, I wanna point out even right now, Psyche is the name of the mission, and in a rare turn of events, it is not an acronym. In other words, it's not letters standing for something else. Psyche is actually named after the object it is going to study, which is technically 16 Psyche. So you'll hear people say Psyche is going to Psyche and they're not going crazy. That is what's happening. It's the mission Psyche going to 16 Psyche. If I zoom in for you a little bit, we can take a look at what this probe looks like. We can see here, uh, by the way, again, this did launch this morning, and it is now then about 12 and a half hours into its mission. And you can see it's got some very nice solar power, uh, solar panels, I should say, ready to go. Now, it is on its way, as I mentioned, to an object that is 
let me get the number right here, over 562 million kilometers away. And that would be the equivalent of just about 3.76 astronomical units. And if you want like a comparison, one astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So if we see our Sun and the Earth, that is technically one astronomical unit. And so little Psyche, who just left, then is on its way to 3.76 astronomical units. If I zoom out for you, that is between Mars and Jupiter. So we see now this orange orbit, that's the orbit for Mars. And then this is the orbit for Jupiter. And we're going in between there. And in fact, if you see right here, that is the orbit for 16 Psyche. So this little probe has a long way to go. Once it gets there, it will um, put all of its scientific instruments to work. They include what's called a multi-spectral imager. In other words, they'll be able to take pictures in many different wavelengths of light. They'll be able to take a look at gamma rays and neutrons with a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. It has a magnetometer. And now if you think about that, that sensor, it literally will be detecting the direction and strength of magnetic fields. This one, the scientists are very excited about, which is part of why they have sent the mission to 16 Psyche. This is thought to be a primarily metal world. They think it may even be a remnant core of, of maybe a failed planet they just don't know yet, but they believe this to be mostly metal. And even with the Earth, by the way, which we also then have a hard core, the magnetic field of the Earth varies depending on where you are on the planet's surface. So part of what 16 Psyche will do is it is going to use that magnetometer to map out the magnetic fields, which can help us understand more about the makeup of the inside of that object. And then it also has an X-band gravity science investigator. Now, coming back in here on the, uh, if I zoom back in on Psyche, on the probe, one of the other objects, or I should say devices that it has with it is a special communication demonstrator. They call it the Deep Space Optical Communication, or DSOC. And do they call it DSOC? I don't know. <laughs> but what I do know is they're actually going to test a new sophisticated laser communication technology. So remember that we have our DSN, we have our deep space network, and I'm not too far from one of those uh, big antenna and big complexes at Goldstone outside of Barstow, California. But those are all using radio signals and need really large antennas. This demonstrator is actually going to use laser and in infrared light to send communication. What they are hoping is that they'll be able to send much more data at a faster rate, which will become more and more important as we send humans farther away from Earth also. So this is not a mission critical device to have this type of communication, but it is what they call, again, a demonstrator where we hope to prove if this will indeed be useful. All right, well, that's what I wanted to share about this. Again, it's the Psyche mission on its way to the asteroid Psyche. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. All right, and on that and note, shall I think we... we're ready for your next object. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's do a galaxy. This is the Triangulum Galaxy, and now everyone must guess what constellation might this galaxy be if we're looking at the borders? Well, you didn't have to guess too hard to say, yep, it is the Triangulum <laughs> constellation. <laughs> this is the binocular view. So we actually have, again, a good binocular object with this galaxy. Uh, just like its neighbor, so to speak. Um, well, not it's kind of far away, but I often associate Triangulum with Andromeda galaxy. But what I mean is both of them make good binocular objects. This is, again, a spiral galaxy, and it has an apparent magnitude of about 5.72, and it's between 2,380 light years and a little over 3,000 light years. And it contains 
about 40 billion stars. Wow. Now, here's our view with an eight inch telescope, approximate view, I should say. Now, I'll, I'll stress again, it would not be this bright with our looking at it with our eyeballs, but this is approximately how much you would see. We do have a bright core and then we can definitely start to see how this is a spiral galaxy. It's estimated to be about 50,000 light years in diameter. So if you think about that, if you were standing at one edge of that galaxy and turn on a flashlight, somebody on the other side would not see that light for 50,000 years, just about. So it is a big object. So we'll, I think, yeah, Rohr is going to show how we could find this object. But again, this is another one that you can go after with binoculars and then absolutely worth it to take a look at with the telescope also. Exactly, exactly. And this one's called the Triangulum Galaxy. So let's see if we can find it. All right, so the first thing we want to do is, do you mind if I mention um, Andromeda while we're here? I think that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. I'll put in the all the names and everything so you can see it. All right, here's Cassiopeia. We're now very familiar. It's a great constellation, lots of goodies. So notice that it has those two triangles. So before we were looking at the short one, now we're looking at the tall one. This triangle, if you can think of it as an arrow, it's pointing towards this bright star here. When you get to this bright star, you're going to back up one, two, and right here is the Andromeda galaxy. What's really cool is if you continue and you go back to the bright star and you go about the same distance on the other side, there's M33. This is the one that Brian was just talking about. So let's go back and do that one more time, and this time I'll take off all the, the cool labels and everything. All right, going for a walk, going for a walk. Let's shake it up here. <laughs> okay, do you see Cassiopeia? All right, so point to it. Good. Now we're going to take the, the larger of the two triangles. So here's the larger one. It's pointing, think of it like an arrow, it's pointing to the star. Then we're going to back up. We're going to go back towards Cassiopeia one, two, and look, and you're going to put your binoculars right there. And you're going to see it'll, in binoculars, it'll look like that. It'll look a little fuzzy, depending on how dark your, on how clear your skies are and how dark your skies are. It'll look like fuzzy. In a telescope, it probably looks a little more like this, depending on the size of your telescope. And then you're going to go back to that bright star that Cassiopeia was pointing at. And then you're going to go the same distance, but on the other side. So go away from Cassiopeia, and you'll see, drop down just a little bit. And this is M33, the Triangulum Galaxy. Um, this one's going to be more dim than Andromeda, uh, but it's definitely worth finding both galaxies if, you can, if, you, uh, if your skies are, are nice and clear. Yeah. And to the person asking about rain, yes, I would not stargaze if it's raining. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> I have a funny story about that I'll share with you sometime. Um, okay, so, oh, I should probably show you on the little, um, on this guy here. Oh, look, <laughs> I should have blown this up bigger. Okay, so we are in this busy little area here. Here's Cassiopeia. It is pointing to this bright star in Andromeda here. And then we're going to go this way for M31. That was the Andromeda galaxy. And then we're going to go on the other side, and we will find M33. This is the triangulum, which is right there. Okay. Okay, so that's what we're looking here. This is M33, and it's even labeled M33 on your start chart. Good. Okay, Brian, what do you have? You have one more object for us, don't you? Yes, okay. I do. I have one more object, and that object would be an apparent star, which is actually a binary. And so for this, I am using Stellarium to show this one because uh, Telescopius focuses on technically deep sky objects such as galaxies, nebulae, and the such. And so uh, with this one, Albirio, this is a really good go-to object, by the way, for public events. Um, for instance, sometimes I'll be providing telescope views at a school and they want everyone to be safe, so they keep all the parking light, light lights all on. Oh. And so we can barely see the night sky. <laughs> so Albirio is the kind of object that you go after, but yet it still impresses. So um, while I'm here, Aurora, I'll, I'll yeah. go ahead and actually yeah, show please. where it is, but we could probably talk about some star hopping because I have a lot of yeah. things turned on. Go for it. But um, we're actually talking about the constellation Cygnus now. And Cygnus also is um, has the star Deneb, which would be one of the three from the Summer Triangle. 
which would be Deneb, Vega, and Altair. And so right now we could be looking up at the night sky. And yes, I know it is fall, but we still are able to have hints of actually the full summer triangle. It's not straight overhead anymore, but it is still there. If you go to Cygnus and if you start at Deneb, which will be the brightest, and you come towards the middle of what appears to be a cross, and then you go to the end, which would be just about the middle of the summer triangle, that is Alberio. And it is actually a binary star. So this is it has two stars orbiting each other. And what's wonderful is this is one of those rare objects where we can look at them in a telescope and actually see some color. Uh, oftentimes they're described as blue and gold. Mm -hmm. And the colors of the stars come from their temperature. The blue is hotter. But Alberio is definitely a great object. Um, and uh, you'll need a telescope to separate them. In other words, I'd be surprised if you could notice two dis distinct stars in binoculars. But in a telescope, absolutely, you'll break those two apart and you can see them. If you do have binoculars that it can split them, they'll be really close together. Awesome. Well, that's what I wanted to share about this one. That's great. Here, let me use a different color here. So the summer triangle um, that we were just talking about is Deneb is here. So you are basically looking straight overhead, and you're going to see D-E-N-E-B. It's right in here. It's Cygnus the swan. You can see the wings of the swan and the head. So Deneb and Vega and Altair make this summer triangle nice and big in the summer sky, which, well, like he said, I know it's fall, but we can still see it. So Brian was looking right here. So the swan is moving through the triangle between Vega and Altair. Deneb is actually um, a word that means the rear end of a duck. <laughs> and so that's the, the star down here. Okay, and that's the tail feathers of the swan. So we're looking at Alberio, which is right here. And they don't know for sure if it is a true binary, they're going around each other, or if it is just an illusion where it's just because of our line of sight. That requires us to get more information and data about velocity of the stars, which takes time. <laughs> and there's a lot of stars out there to be able to do that with. So, good. Um, we had a couple questions about planets. Do you mind if we chat just for a quick second? I pulled up. Sure, sounds uh, good. Yeah, okay. I pulled up something here. Um, okay, so tonight you could go outside and look at two planets, which I think are best in binoculars because um, you don't need a fancy telescope. And what you can do is just you're going to go outside. Rising in the east, you're going to see Jupiter. And then if you'll notice, there is a path that the planets take, the sun takes, the moon takes, because of uh, that we live in a disk of a solar system. So that projects against the night sky in a certain path. And most of the objects, the large objects, the, the eight planets and the, the sun and the moon are going to follow that. And so you can see... Here, they're, um, they're going to trace that path through the sky. This is called the ecliptic. And so Jupiter is going to be straight east, and Saturn is going to be um, a little further along that path here, more to the south. And if you look at your binoculars, if you put your binoculars, for example, on Jupiter, you will see something that looks like, look at this. You see the dots? <laughs> so this is what you'll see in a telescope, and it looks like one of them is really close in here um, but you will see it'll they'll all look like little teeny dots all in a row and so the ones that are in the row are in Jupiter the ones that are all over the place those are going to be Saturn's moons the only time Saturn's moons line up is if you're looking straight on to the um, if the the rings are like edge on to us that's the only time you'll see them in general they'll be lined up but um, so you can see the moons of another planet using binoculars that's just mind-blowing <laughs> so <laughs> all right, so that's all I was going to share about that. Um, they're not on the star chart, in case you're wondering, simply because they're in a different spot every night. <laughs> and so I think the ecliptic is on the on the chart, though, if I remember right. Yeah, it's right here. Do you see the ecliptic? Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I made a mistake. They are here. Jupiter and Saturn. So here's your ecliptic. Here's your ecliptic. And so this, this chart, I think, is for mid-month. Okay, which is where we are. So there's Jupiter and there's Saturn right in there. Okay. All right, now I'm done. Okay. <laughs> so Brian, did you have any other things you wanted to share or questions that you had come in? Let's see. Uh, we just had a question come in about which galaxy it was that we had shared. So that was the Triangulum Galaxy, also known as M33, 
and M is the Messier number. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, Messier 33 for that one. Good. And, yeah, and other than that, just remind everyone again that we do have an annular solar eclipse in the continental United States, and you can Google 2023 eclipse to have more information about how much coverage there will be of the sun in your area. Yes, and if you live in Texas, you are lucky ducks because you get this eclipse and also the one that's coming yes. up August. No, April, in April, uh, in spring. Of so, next year. Of yes. next year. Yeah, yeah, but they both intersect. <laughs> So, yes. <laughs> so that's great. And somebody's asking about will Andromeda first consume triangular or the Milky Way? Um, as far as I know, triangulum is going in a different direction. It's going to totally not be in the path of Andromeda. Don't quote me on that, but that's last time somebody asked a question like that, from what I remember. Unless yeah, I, I, that one I just looked up. Um, and there are some simulations that suggest that triangulum will eventually be devoured by Andromeda. Oh, but okay. I do think that, yeah, the Milky Way would be first. And consume is not necessarily the right word nope. as as they'll intersect. Gravitationally and, interact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, so it looks like Milky Way, they'll, they'll meet each other, Milky Way and Andromeda Galaxy first, and then they'll possibly continue on. Got but, it. I mean, I just don't know that we have the computing power or understanding yet to calculate that far into the future what Andromeda galaxy will even look like once it goes through. I'm sure they have some simulations, but then that's going pretty far out there in time. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So, yeah, it's only as good as the, yeah, it's the simulation, um, which is only as good as the physics behind it. So, good. Um, if you can go ahead and put in the chat for me, everyone, what your favorite object is in the night sky. It'll give us some ideas of what to talk about next time. Could be a favorite constellation. What is what is something that either you're interested in, you'd like us to, um, to focus on, what you'd like us to see. And also, if you have some equipment at home, you want to tell us what kind of telescope you have, we would love to be able to see that as well. I have um, a Celestron, uh, what do I have? I have a, no, I have a Mead Skyview Pro, which is eight inches. I also have a Schmidt Cassegrain uh, made by Mead, which which is also eight inches. So those are my two. My favorite piece of astronomical equipment for me, while you're typing in, is uh, my pair of binoculars. So my Uberwork binoculars, which are 25 by 100s, probably my favorite. <laughs> because I can be in and out in like five minutes. So the setup and breakdown of those is awesome, and it performs like a four and a half inch telescope. So I think that's really fun. Uh, but yeah, let us know what you'd like to us to focus on, and if it's up, we'll give it a go. We would love to hear from you. It's been a pleasure being able to offer this to you. We are stargazing live tomorrow, and we will have some um, uh, more um, opportunities in the future. If you would like more information about our club, usually I usually have a tagline on the bottom, but I forgot to put it in. Um, it's centralcoastastronomy.org, so centralcoastastronomy.org, and you can find out more about us, and you can become a member. You can just come to our stargazing events. And we, you can just ask us questions, and we're happy to help you because... We want you to get outside, go and just look up and, <laughs> and just enjoy the night sky. So, Brian, do you have any other last closing remarks before we sign off? No, I don't think so. Thanks, everyone, for letting us share this uh, little tidbit of the night sky with you. And so definitely encourage you when you can go and look up. <laughs> and by the way, we have recordings of a few years now worth of these. So one of the things that you can do is you could start one of these videos not watch it though because you don't want to lose your night vision but you can actually use these videos to help you have a tour of the night sky and just listen along with us and we'll share about the objects and again we've been mentioning kent so we have many objects with kent also or i should say recordings where he then also will be giving you much more details on these objects as we go around so yes. but thanks again for joining us tonight everybody Absolutely. And Kent is just, he's such a gem of um, just a wealth of information. He will sit there. He won't even be looking at star charts and he'll be like, oh, Aurora, make sure you go a little bit further here and go past this star. But if you go in here, you've gone too far. And he does it all from memory. So <laughs> it, we love to be able to learn from him. So yay. So thank you, Kent. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all for joining us. And we will see you at our next stargazing event. Bye-bye.